know, there's, there's just so much to, um, to deal with <laughs> that I, you could never run out of subjects. You know, if you're really wanting to study the Bible, um, you, you, there's just not enough time. I tried very hard. I was just telling one of the staff people in my office, I was trying very hard to just stay with those few words and restrict to those words and stay focused. It's real easy to go on and talk about certain things which I would like to reserve as kind of um, directions to discuss because they flow through the whole book of Hebrews. Just even a side-by-side, -side, I've already done this, a side-by-side -side comparison of the uh, Levitical priesthood and what is being unfolded in Hebrews. And some of the most in just incredible things that even though we've read Leviticus 16 and we know about the Day of Atonement and there's certain things, in fact, there's certain things that the writer of Hebrews has, for some reason, deliberately left out, like men the mentioning of the scapegoat, the, the two goats, or there's certain things that have deliberately been left out and other things that it seems like the driving force in included. We're specifically looking at the blood and we're specifically focusing on the mercy seat. Or These concepts are We've read them before, but when you begin to analyze them carefully, it's, it's, it's mind-boggling. It, it not only inspires faith, it inspires confidence. I mean, not that perhaps we need more confidence, but that which, when you open the book again, you just, it's almost, you almost have to shake your head and say it's, it's just something overwhelming that not only did whoever wrote this understood and had such a firm grasp on the old dispensation, but exactly how Christ fulfilled it in the new. And to have that deep of an understanding, that's really what's mind-boggling. And how he makes it apply, and how he makes it understood. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm excited. I'm excited to get into um, teaching on Melchizedek, because I know that's, that's kind of one of those things that we all kind of scratch our heads a little bit and go, hmm, which is very exciting, because there's a lot of things that in my studies I have when you focus on something, you begin to notice, oh, I, I, I wasn't paying attention. I didn't see that. And then you go down different pathways. So Melchizedek's going to be a great study for us. Um, and just, there's just so many things in this book that are, are amazingly interesting. They create, like I said, they build confidence. And they create some other certainty. There are books in the Bible, like I said, Romans, Ephesians, Galatians, which those three books have to be my absolute favorites. I love them. Each one has something different, but I love them. Um, I find that Colossians, for example, has elements of Ephesians and, and Galatians, but Hebrews is just in, it's just in its own realm. And picking apart, um, it's almost like this, um, what I call this didactic flow of things, like how brilliant and inspired by the Holy Spirit, all of these were, uh, all these writers were, maybe except for James, uh, <laughs> but how the flow of what he is unfolding, the manner of teaching, there's, there's this uh, introduction, even the element, the very beginning of telling us how God spoke to the fathers, how he spoke to them through the prophets, hath in these last days spoken to us to, by his son. And, you follow just that flow through this um, some kind of bifurcated pathway to see how the old, the fathers, the prophets, the new, the last, Jesus Christ, all the way through the book. He starts that way, and you think that only has to do with him speaking, but the revelation flows right through the book. So it's these things that I'm, I'm just riveted by. And of course, there's, there's other things, being able to go back into the Old Testament. Um, certain things that I, along the way, I either vaguely remember in passing, oh yeah, I remember Dr. Scott saying this, or I remember reading a book on that. Um, one of them, which I'm kind of pining to get to, is um, it was a, a study done, which was neatly concealed. <clears throat> um, 
this comes out, it's not out of the Talmud, but it's, uh, it's out of one of those uh, commentary type, I don't even want to call it you know, mystical, it's not Kabbalism or anything, but there was a writing which was neatly concealed and covered up so that no one would, <laughs> no one would find it, and you really got to look hard to find anything on it um, regarding what some people call legend of the, um, the bleeding veil. And um, within, within Jewry, I think it's been very quieted and very suppressed, even though it has a um, legendary element to it. Um, they place the timing of this event at approximately 30 AD. Uh, so, and it's, it's just an incredible, now whether it's a, you know, legendary and whether it's mythical or whether it's a real happening, um, but they claim that the, um, in, in this detailed report, they claim somehow that the colors on the veil never went back to the colors that they were, and in fact, crimson covered. Now they wanted to say, you know, this was some miracle event, but then they began to label it as the bleeding veil. And that actually got very suppressed. There's all kinds of interesting things that if you dig, you'll find, you know, if one was making a case um, to build for the resurrection, presenting the resurrection, there's so much evidence in these kind of strange pockets that you can find of suppressed information, whether they be legendary or not, is still very interesting of how ancient these things are, that one would try to suppress that because it points to something at exactly calendar-wise. We, we know that the calendar is not just and right. We say um, Jesus lived to be 33 years old, but whether his death is at 30, whatever the calendar swings, you know, how, how, that's kind of a coincidence that they place this event at 30. That's kind of interesting. So uh, anyway, we'll talk about all kinds of different things. And uh, it's kind of a, a nice excuse to be able to go back into the book of Leviticus and the book of Exodus and discuss certain things. Um, just amazing things. You know, I, I think about how Jesus lamented and he wept. You know, how often I would have gathered you under my wings, but you would not. He offered up prayers, and then the writer of the Hebrews says how he offered up prayers before he entered in. And I combine those two thoughts with the imagery of the priest who had those, what I've labeled them as epaulets, the six names of the tribes on each shoulder going in, bearing the 12 tribes, the names of the 12 tribes, the children of Israel, if you will, on his shoulders. And I think about Isaiah saying the government was upon his shoulders and thinking of Christ, the suffering servant. And I tie these images together and I think to myself, who could read this book and a not be riveted and not come to the conclusion that God's hand in all of this to paint such a clear picture of our Savior, Jesus Christ, and his work. So anyway, lots of exciting things. <laughs> uh, it's like too many books, too little time, too much information, not enough time. Come to this house.